Hey online family, I'm David and I want to welcome you into our online service. In a few minutes, we're going to worship together and hear a message from Pastor John called A Beautiful Thing Called Church. But before we do, we just want to remind you, if you want to stay up to date on all things related to our online family, you can go to ucov.com online and fill out that online connection card. Be sure to indicate that you regularly attend our online services and we'll be sure to keep you updated. And if you're new to our online services, you can also go fill out that online connection card and be sure to indicate if this is your first or second time joining us online. Now here's what's coming up at our church. First, we are excited to announce that on Sunday, September 25th, we will be having a welcome back celebration with our entire church. As college students are coming back to Davis, as new families move in, and as all of us are getting back from our summer travels, this is a great opportunity to reconnect with our church family, as well as welcome anyone who may be new. So be sure to mark your calendar Sunday, September 25th at 10.30 a.m. out on the UCC lawn. We will be having this celebration after our 9.30 a.m. service and before our 11 a.m. service. So for those of you who attend the 11 a.m., be sure to come a little bit early to celebrate and note that the 11 a.m. service will be at 11.15 that Sunday only. We will have snacks, coffee, and games, so hope to see you there. Also, as we've been mentioning these last few weeks, we are putting an extra emphasis on life groups this fall, and we wanted you to hear from a few more people in our church about why they love being a part of life group. Hi, my name is Mark Villalon. By day, I'm a cardiologist, which is the type of physician that takes care of people's hearts. By night, I am a dad of four. <laughs> Uh, husband for over a decade uh, to my wife Rachel. My name is Estela Soria Herringer or Maestra Estela. I am an educator. My family and I have been coming to UCC for about five years now. Hi, I'm Joseph. I make candy for a living actually and I work at Jelly Belly Candy Company down in Fairfield. Um, I've been coming to UCC off and on about eight years now. So in college, I was involved in our college fellowship catalyst. But after that, especially with the pandemic, it was kind of harder to connect, especially with the young adults. Um, David approached me and he asked me if I was interested in joining a life group. And I very eagerly said yes. I was looking for more community, for more adults in the same life stage as I was, after, especially after graduating college and sticking around in Davis. And I made a great community and a great bunch of friends through this. Being in a life group has given me so many new perspectives on life itself, on my life as a follower of Christ. The life group allows me to be vulnerable with people who are with me, like me, and it helps me make room, make space, because I do believe we're all busy and sometimes we tell ourselves, and I'm very guilty of telling myself I'm too busy, but trying to find room, finding some margin and space, for Christ in my life and making that happen, those are all the reasons and how the Life Group has really helped me on a very personal level. I recommend a Life Group because I don't think God meant for us to go through life alone. It's a lot more fun and the hard moments are more bearable when you have people around you that care about you, that know you, and that want the best for you. We really hope that even those a part of our online family will be able to get connected to a life group this fall as we start this eight-week campaign through the Gospel of John on September 11th. We will be going through John during our sermons, you'll be reading through John during the week alongside an N.T. Wright book study, and then talking about it in our weekly life groups. We're also going to be sharing our stories and going through a prayer experience. So we really hope you get plugged into a life group this fall. You can simply go to ucov.com slash lifegroups to see all of our available groups. As a church family, one way we serve each other is by prayer. Whether you are a regular attender or first-time guest, we would love to pray for you. 
So if you would like us to partner with you in prayer or celebrate with you in praise, simply go to ucov.com prayer, write out your prayer request or praise and know that our prayer team will welcome the opportunity to pray for you during the week. Thank you again for being here with us online. As we continue our service, will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we just come before you today, we are excited to launch this new series in the book of John, but we also recognize that we want to do so in the context of community. So for those of us who are on the fence about joining a life group, I pray that you would give us the confidence to just take that little step of faith um, to get more connected to our church. We also just pray for all of our life groups coming into this uh, new season, that they would be an exciting time of not only connection, but that we would be able to draw closer to you. So we just thank you and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Oceans of kindness, wave after wave. Mercy arriving again and again. Your love will find us, you're never far away. Battles behind us, battles ahead. God, you are for us, so what stands against? We have this promise, you're never far away. We see your faithfulness in the darkest night. We see your goodness, God. you are for us so what stands against we have this promise you're never far away we've seen your faithfulness we see your faithfulness in the darkest night we see your goodness god favor glory in Jesus name from morning to dancing in Jesus name from battle to blessing we go in Jesus name let's declare that again together from glory from glory to glory in Jesus name from morning to dancing in Jesus name from battle to blessing we go in Jesus name a special day for me. It was my wedding day. Now, one of my dreams for my wedding day was not only Becky, obviously the center of that, but it was all my friends who were part of our story, who, who walked alongside us, who loved us well, and they were in our wedding party. And the way we had arranged it is that uh, they would be coming down the aisle together. And my dream was to be up front in the aisle before my bride Becky came down and just to get to see all the friends who had 
loved us and who had invested in us, who are our community around us. And so when we planned the wedding uh, ceremony, it was all about me being up front, watching them come by, and then finally my bride would come. But it was particularly important to me that I got to celebrate all those who became, came before my bride as well. So here's what happened the day of. I was uh, in the back room with all my groomsmen, um, all the groomsmen were told to go get ready for the worship, uh, sorry, the, the wedding service. And it was my best man and me waiting for the wedding quarter to come get us. In the meantime, we were playing a great game of foosball. I don't remember the results, but I was probably winning. I was having a great time. And, um, you know, time went by and we realized no one's really coming to get us. That's strange. And we thought surely they wouldn't forget the groom. And so we play a little longer. And then my groomsman or my best man gets a little concerned. He's like, you know, we should go check what's going on. And so we mosey our way. We're chatting, talking and we uh, are behind the, we're in the back room of the worship center, so not the front. And we see the pastor who is officiating the service there. He goes, where have you guys been? He's totally panicking. We're like, what do you mean? He's like, the service has already started. I'm like, what? And so we, all three of us walk in in a hurry and literally I walk in as the last of my friends come in. Like the whole line had, had already been there. And I was like, furious in the midst of my own wedding because this is not what I had planned. And if you look at our wedding video, you'll see my best man just rubbing my back, trying to calm me down. Um, but this story would have been a lot worse. I mean, this, this was bad, but man, it would have been a lot worse had I missed the bride. I mean, can you imagine? But what I want to say is one of the joy and delights was standing there and watching my bride, Becky, come down. And the story isn't a tragedy. It's a sad thing, but it would have been a tragedy had I missed my bride. Wouldn't you agree? But I didn't miss that. It's so interesting that Jesus calls his church his bride. I mean, his bride. And for all the angst you would have felt for me had I missed my bride, can you imagine the love that Christ has for his bride? Here's another interesting thing. If you love me, and if you think I'm the best thing since sliced bread, but you can't stand my wife, that rips at me. In fact, I would have a hard time reconciling. I mean, if you love me, you've got to love my wife. I mean, my love for her is so connected to your love for me that if you start separating those things, I would be destroyed. And I want to say, brothers and sisters, that Jesus makes the same argument for his church. He has a very difficult time reconciling that you might say, well, I love Jesus. I just can't stand his church. Scripture says that's just impossible because if you love Christ, you've got to love his bride. Now, there might be flaws with his bride. You know, there might be things that aren't perfect. Of course, Jesus would even agree with you on those things. Scripture, throughout Scripture, there's this theme of God trying to woo his people back, woo his bride back. He would never call his bride perfect, but he would always call his bride loved. And in 1 John 4, 19, it says this, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister. This is like in the church. If you say, I love God, but I can't stand his family, it says, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You can't separate the two. You can't. When scripture talks about how husbands are to love their wives, they use this illustration of, well, model it after how Jesus loves the church. That this love is so deep. And so many times I hear people go, yeah, I can't stand the church. It's imperfect. And I would go, yeah, it's imperfect. But for some reason, God still chooses to love his bride. Jesus still chooses to love his bride. And for some reason, it's God's chosen instrument, this thing called the church, for his redemptive plan in the world. It's a beautiful thing that we call the church. It's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful not because it's perfect, but because it's Jesus' beloved bride. It's loved by God. And brothers and sisters, if you want to love God, you've got to love his bride. You can't separate the two. Next week, we're going to start a, a campaign going through the first chunk of the Gospel of John. Just a reminder, we're going to spend the whole year going through the Gospel of John, but in our life groups, we're asking our life groups to spend the first eight weeks of the series together studying John. And beyond that, that's up to each life group. But as we go into this, I think the, the why behind this is the love of God's bride. 
the fact that we're doing this together and wanting everyone to be part of some type of smaller community called a life group has everything to do with loving Jesus' church, the bride, and believing it's a good thing. And I know there are people who say, I can't stand the institutional church. I can't stand organized religion. And some of us have really valid pain in the church. I don't want to ignore any of that. But I don't want that to turn into, well, therefore, we can dislike the church or not feel committed to it, but we still love God. Those two things can't be reconcilable. Do we need time to maybe heal, maybe get over some very painful things? Absolutely. Do we, can we call out you know, where the church is broken? Absolutely. But never let that give you an excuse to not be deeply in love with God's church. In God's eyes, the church is a beautiful thing. I shared one reason why we got to be committed to God's church. I want to share a few more just as we go into this. And where I want to go with this is talk about how you and I can be as committed to Christ's church as Christ is himself, or at least have the same type of love as Christ does. Before I get into that, though, I want to talk about why the church is so important. Not only did I share it's Christ's bride and his loyalty to the church, but there's other benefits we have through the church. Uh, One other one is that God grows you spiritually through his church family. God uses this thing called the church family for you, for you to grow spiritually. Now, let me just clarify. When I use the word church, most often people think of a building or an institution. What I want to do is use it in the biblical sense. The church is God's family. The church is those who are part of God's family, who are uh, loving God and loving each other. So think of it as a people group. In other words, if one day there's a huge hurricane or earthquake on 315 Mace Boulevard and the church just crumbled, the church building just crumbled, the church would still exist. That, that's irrelevant. The church is the people. It's not the building. The building is a tool, but it's not the essence of what the church is. But one of the things scripture says is that God actually uses the church family to grow you spiritually. This is in contrast to this mentality of I can do God life on my own. I don't need anyone, it's just me and God, and it's just a personal private thing. That language is so foreign to scripture. You just don't hear that. No, our life with God is connected to our life with one another. God actually uses our life with one another to shape us. Think about this. When Jesus wanted to shape his disciples, how did he do it? He did in community. He didn't call one person. He called 12 people. Here's an example of Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 1. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. He says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Right after this, Jesus calls James and John, and later on he calls eight other people. But most of Jesus' time with his disciples was when they were with each other in community. You rarely see times where Jesus, at least in scripture, it's recorded that he had one-on-one time with people. I'm not knocking one-on-one, but just to understand that the formation that happened was in a community. When Paul the apostle did his ministry, he was always with groups of people because he understood that our life with God is intricately connected to our life with one another. Several weeks ago in a sermon, I shared this picture of a grinder. I'll put it up right now. It's this idea that we're shaped not by just sculpting ourselves or God sculpting us, but we're shaped by God sculpting us while we're actually rubbing shoulders with one another. That It's the rubbing shoulders with one another that shapes us, and God uses that for His shaping of you. And, and let me just say one more thing about how God uses community. Some of our most formative times in our life with God happens in the midst of crisis. I'm not sure if you know that, but as you look back at your life, often it's a a big loss that you've had or a big crisis you've had, or even a crisis of faith you've had. Most people in those moments come out better or worse by who they're connected to in those moments. And when you're going through crisis and you're surrounded by people who love God and love you and are able to provide perspective and care, you come out often loving God more. But man, if you're surrounded by people who don't have that, you often leave those tough situations having more doubt in God and more cynicism towards God. So he uses people to shape you. This is why it's so important to be part of God's family. Here's a second reason why it's important to be part of church family is that God uses your love for the church family to make a difference in the world. Um, This is, again, 
in contrast to the idea that all I have to do is on my own be a witness for God. All I have to do in my workplace or in my school or my college is just be on my own and make sure people understand God just through my life. All that is good, but that's not your primary witness. Jesus says that, that it's actually our countercultural love for one another that's one of the biggest witnesses in our society. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 16 through 17 says this, Don't you know that you yourselves, plural, are God's temple? And the God's spirit dwells in your midst. Here, Paul the Apostle says, don't you understand that when we're together, we're actually God's temple? We're actually the place where heaven meets earth, where God's spirit dwells? There is something special when the people of God gather together because God's spirit is especially active in their midst. And he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, I mean ruining relationships here, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Paul makes such a case that if you're actually a part of causing discord in God's church, there's consequences because this is God's temple. It doesn't mean you ignore conflict. In fact, we'll get into that. It doesn't mean you do any kind of cover-up, but more of it is that our posture needs to be, we want to invest in the health of God's church, God's people, God's community, because it's through that that God's temple is made visible. His presence is made visible on this earth. And perhaps the most overquoted verse I've used the last year, I'll say it again, is John 13, 35, where Jesus says, a new command I give you, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone you will know, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is teaching his disciples, his followers. He says, you've got to love one another. You've got to. He says, now use my example. The way I've loved you, please love one another. How will people know that you're the church, you're my disciples? It's by your love for one another. This idea of making a difference in our world is not meant to be an individual thing. It's meant to be a communal thing. And there is something about our countercultural love for one another that crosses gender, crosses class, crosses education, crosses ethnicity, that is so powerful that people say, this must be God. This is God's temple. It's through God's love for our church and our love for one another that our witness is shown to this world. That's why the church is so important. I want to say one more thing, just as a reminder as to why church is so important. And that is God created you for belonging. God created you for community. God did not create you to just look at your navel and decide who you are. He created you to discover who you are in the midst of the life of other people. It's a we thing that he's created you for, and you find your most authentic self in his community. Belonging and friendship are so needed in our world. It needs to combat anxiety and depression and isolation because you were created for this. It's interesting that in Genesis 1, 26, when God created mankind, the language is, let us make mankind in our image. Even in creation of us, God is looking at his internal community and saying, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's make humankind to be a reflection of us. They are meant to be living in community. Brothers and sisters, I don't want you to take this church thing lightheartedly. It is so core. Church is not just something you attend. Church is not just something you go to. Church is the family of God. And God is so committed to this family. And it's through this family that you grow. It's through this family that our witness is shown. And it's through this family where you discover your most authentic self because God created you for belonging. So with that, now I want to give you a huge challenge. This has been the big why, but I want to shift to how do you live out be God's family. How do you live out being part of this beautiful thing called church? I want to give you uh, three things to reflect on. Actually, I just lied. I want to give you five things uh, to reflect on here. Here's number one. First, I want you to reflect on God. All of this starts with God. I want you to reflect on what he's done for you. Reflect on God and what he's done for you. 
the idea of Christian community isn't about, oh, I'm going to try harder to be involved. I'm going to, be try, I'm going to try harder to be part of his church. It really is a response to God, who he is, and what he's already done. I've already talked about that God has internal community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has community, and he created us in community. And we relate to God, not just as Father, not just as Son, not just as Holy Spirit, but in a mystery, he is all three, and yet he is still one. But to recognize that to follow God means you are following a God of community who creates in community. And my favorite part about God's community is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always trying to out-glorify one another, out-love one another. Jesus illustrates this in John 17. And just, just listen to this. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. That means to make holy and to lift up. Glorify your Son. Why? That your Son may glorify you. <laughs> Isn't this great? Jesus says, Father, now's the time. Will you just lift me up? Because I want to lift you up. This is like this internal battle competition of who's going to outdo one another in honor. Who's going to outdo one another in glory. He says, I have brought you, Father, glory on earth by finishing the work you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. We get this sense that even God outglorifies himself. He models a community where Father, Son, Holy Spirit are always trying to uplift the other, to bring glory to one another. See, our sense of commitment to community really starts with who God is and what he's like. And church family exists because of what God and his community has done for us. As you know, through our sin, we became estranged from God. We, we broke bonds of, that were created. And God in his love through the sacrifice of his son restored that relationship. And now that we are able to be restored, we can look at God and, and call him father. We are restored and he adopts us into his family. But it also means as we are adopted into his family, we, all, we also have new brothers and sisters with one another. Ephesians 2.19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. And, and here, uh, the scripture is talking about how we see one another. We're no longer st strangers or foreigners with one another. But we are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. God has not only adopted you and me into his family, but he's given us a new family. We have new brothers and sisters of all ethnicities and classes and male and female together. We're in this together. So the first thing is just to reflect on this whole idea of Christ's community it has a lot to do with who God is and his essence and what he has done for us. Here's another thing that we can do to be part and live out being church family is to commit to church commit to a church and commit to our family members. The idea of church is not one of convenience of, oh, I'll see if this works out for me. I'll see if I'm busy or not. There's a sense of, no, I'm going to commit to this body, this local body that God has put me in. What makes a church family special is that we are in this together. It's so interesting that when Paul saw that there was conflict in the church, it wasn't a, oh, well, too bad, or I hope one of them leaves. It was a sense of, I want you to be committed to work this out together. And if, uh, in Philippians 4, verse 2, he says, I plead with Yodia, and I plead with Synteche to be of the same mind of the Lord. He actually calls out two women in the church who are his ministry partners who aren't getting along. He says, I plead with you to get along, to be of the same mind. Your love for one another is so essential. I plead with you to do that. But then he says, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. We don't know who Paul's referring to, but he calls out someone else in the church and says, will you please help these women to get along? There's a sense that church is a commitment, and there are times where the church is imperfect, where we hurt each other, where things are done that, that break expectations, and it's, it's wrong, it's harmful. But there's also a commitment to, and we're going to try to work this out. He pleads with two people who aren't getting along to work it out, and he pleads with someone else in the church to come along and help them. Matthew 18 talks about, man, if a brother or sister sins or sins against you, it's worth talking to them and working it out. If that doesn't work, bring in other brothers and sisters to help you out. This idea of church is a sense of commitment. We are in this together, even when it gets hard. We do things like this through membership class. We say, you know, we're going to commit 
to a church family. We do this thing this through like things like life groups. We're gonna to commit to a smaller church family. We're gonna love each other well. You can't experience the benefit of this without commitment. And so as we do membership classes in October and, and launching new life groups uh, the, in these next couple of weeks, I wanna plead with you if you're not in one to commit to one. And if you've been in one but you've been wary because of conflict, to recommit to one and understand how God sees his church, how it's worth working out the differences. The third way you can commit or be part of this thing called, this beautiful thing called the church, is to practice the one another's with each other. So often when we approach community, our mindset is, what, are we, what can we get out of this? What's in it for me? I want to plead with you that the way to get the most out of Christian community is to serve and to love one another. Uh, there are about 59 occurrences in the New Testament where the phrase one another is spoken. It's the idea of how we treat one another in the church. There are things like love one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, be devoted to one another. All those things happen within the context of this beautiful thing called the church. And you're going to have the best place to do this in the context of a life group or serving with people where you get to know them. So one way you want to grow in the church family is as you approach your life group is to have this mindset of how am I going to practice the one another's with one another. You have the opportunity to do this, to not only to receive, but to give. This will happen spontaneously in relationships, but there also may be some formal opportunities to do this. As you get involved in your life group, there's going to be a need to serve and help in different areas. Practice the one another's. Here's the fourth thing, is to outdo one another in honor. One of the biggest things of the earliest church that was so countercultural was how they loved one another across divisions that were seen in their society. We have divisions in our society right now uh, around, va- around race and, and gender and class. One of the things that we do is we don't ignore those differences. We don't say they don't matter. But what we do is we say in the midst of those differences, we're going to hear each other's stories and outdo one another with honor because we are church family. When Paul wrote to a divided church in Romans 12, he says, love must be sincere. It can't just be this feeling, but it's got to have hands and feet to it. He says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. The things that get in the way of this love, get rid of. And the thing that help this love, man, cling to it. And he says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. One of the radical things you can do in your life group and in your church is when you see people who come from a different political persuasion, a different race or story background, things that are different than you, that in our society would cause division, would cause triggers for you to say, you know what, you're my brother and sister. My job is to hear your story and then outdo one another, outdo you in love. We're going to have a competition over right and left. We're going to have a competition over black, Asian, Hispanic, and we're going to try to outdo one another in love. It's so countercultural, and yet this is what God calls us to do. Here's the last thing I want to say. As you commit yourself to this beautiful thing called the church, and you commit to a group, and you understand who God is, and how the church is just an expression of who He is, and how you see differences, and outdo one another in honor, and you commit to these one another's of, I'm not just here for me, but to love other people. What you're doing, and finally, is just to trust God to work in your life. Your job is not to make God change you. Your job is not to conjure up anything. Your, God is just, your, your job is just to be faithful and trust that God's going to do the work in your life. The way I say it is, we're not caused to create waves in the ocean. We're, we're called to create waves. Or it's not, we're not called to create waves in the ocean. We're called to catch waves. Those of you who serve for Boogie Board know that you can't create a wave. Your job is just to position yourself so you catch the wave. When it comes to Christian community, I want you to position yourself in Christ's community, Christ's church, in such a way that you allow God to do the work. He's the wave maker. He's the wave creator. Your job is just to position yourself and watch what he does. Charles Spurgeon says this, If I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I should never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it, for it would, it would not have been perfect. It would not have been a perfect church after I had become a member of it. And here's the thing I want you to see here. Still, and perfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth to us. This is the church, warts and all, 
God loves the church. He uses the relationship with the church to further his purposes. And you can't love God and not love his bride. You just can't. It makes no sense. So love God. Love Jesus' bride. Commit to Jesus' bride. And watch God work. Next week, we begin our Gospel of John series. If you haven't already, get the pamphlet that we put out. Follow the instructions in there. Get involved with a life group if you're not in one. Commit to your life group if you are in one. Start your devotionals that are in there as you prepare for the week. Let's pray for God's beautiful, beautiful thing called the church. Let's pray for his family and let's choose to be part of it and to see his importance and watch God work. God bless you all. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head, my enemy. You come back and you call my victory. Oh.
defend of my heart. And when I thought I lost you, you know where I left. You reintroduced me to your love. You picked up all my pieces, put me back together. You are the defender of my heart. Sing it one more time. When I thought I lost, you know where I left. You Church, today we get to celebrate communion as we think about Christ's family and his love for his family. Communion is a reminder of Jesus' deep love, deep love for his people. He actually gathered his disciples, all 12 of them, on the night before he was betrayed. And in the middle of their Passover meal, he, he took the bread and when he broke it, he said, this is my body given to you. When you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. He never wanted his people to forget his great love for them and that he sacrificed his own self for our sake. In the same way, he took the cup and the wine. He said, this is my blood poured out for you. When you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat of the bread or drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I pray that as you take the bread and drink of the cup, you'd be reminded of God's love, his love for you as a person and individually, his sacrifice for you, and his love for the world and the love for his church family as well. As you take and eat of this, I pray that you know God's deep love for you and for those around you. Let's enjoy this meal together. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Just a reminder, make sure you go take some time to ucuff.com online to fill out that online connection card, and we will keep you up to date on all things related to our online community. We also wanna say thank you to everyone who gives regularly to UCC. 
Your financial giving supports everything we do here at UCC, from our life groups to community outreach and the production of this online service. If UCC is your home church and you would like to partner with us in giving, or if you are a guest and would like to make a one-time gift, we welcome you to join with us in supporting our ministry work, both at home and abroad. So if God leads you to give to UCC today, simply text GIVE to the number on your screen. If you haven't done so, you can also automate your giving on our website at ucov.com give. Thanks again for being with us here online today. We hope you join us again next week as we begin our new series through the Gospel of John. Now receive this benediction. University Covenant Church, God is committed to you and this family, so stay committed to His family as well. Put yourself in a position to catch the waves that He creates, and as He moves you, share His love to all those outside our church walls. Go in peace.